This afternoon, we got a combination of two of President Trump's more indecent characteristics, his willingness to lie to the American people, and his tactic of using racist appeals to incite and excite his supporters. Send her back, they chanted. Now, you know the backstory. The president launched attacks on four Democratic congresswomen of color earlier this week, attacks that even Republican members of the House and Senate called racist. The president suggested that those four congresswomen should go back to the countries where they came from, though three of the four were born in the United States, and all four are American citizens. Last night, it all went one precipitous step further when the president and the crowd focused on Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, who has made controversial comments herself, though... The president's lies about what she has said and demonizing of her prompted results last night that were so shocking, even some of the meekest and least critical Republicans in the House of Representatives voiced their discomfort, if not horror and revulsion. So this afternoon, President Trump suddenly claimed that he disagreed with those ugly chants. I'm not happy about when I hear a chant like that. And I've said that and I've said it very strongly. And the president told a demonstrable lie the lie that he started speaking very quickly so as to end that chant. Why did you ask them to stop saying that? Well, number one, I, I think I did. I started speaking very quickly. It, it really was a loud, I disagree with it, by the way, but it was quite a chant, and uh, I felt a little bit badly about it, but I will say this, uh, I did, and I started speaking very quickly. That's a naked lie. When the chant started, President Trump stopped talking. He let the crowd go. And he did not resume until the chant died out on its own. But don't take my word for it. Take a look at the tape. Omar has a history of launching vicious anti-Semitic screeds. Thirteen seconds. For 13 seconds, the president of the United States stood there as a crowd of supporters screamed that he should send an American citizen, a woman who fled Somalia as a child refugee, now a member of the U.S. Congress, back to Somalia. This is all part and parcel of the president's 2020 reelection strategy. No more dog whistles, just naked racism, telling American citizens who are a different color to go back where they came from. It's a campaign tactic we need to be aware of as a tactic, notwithstanding the obvious immorality of bigotry. CNN's Pamela Brown starts us off today at the White House. Today, President Donald Trump claiming he disavows of that chant at last night's rally, aimed at Somali-born and now U.S. citizen Congresswoman Ilan Omar. I was not happy with it. Uh, I disagree with it. The president pointing the finger at the crowd. I didn't say that, they did. And insisting his tweets and comments this week against Omar and three other Democratic congresswomen of color had nothing to do with it. But they were echoing what you said in your first tweet, that they need to go back. Well, I don't think if you examine it, I don't think you'll find that. Trump also claiming he didn't let the chant last long. But the video shows the president pausing for 13 seconds as the chants grew louder and louder. Reacting today, Congresswoman Omar with strong words for the president. We have said this president is racist. We have condemned his racist remarks. I believe he is fascist. This is not about me. This is about us fighting for what this country truly should be and what it deserves to be. Senator Lindsey Graham, a Trump supporter, defended the crowd against claims the chant was racist, implying if Omar were a Trump supporter, she wouldn't be told to leave. No, I don't think it's racist to say, was it racist to say, love it or leave it? I don't think a Somali refugee embracing Trump would not have been asked to go back. Let me be clear. My beef is uh, with policy, not pers personality. All of these congressmen won their election. They're American citizens. This is their home as much as mine. And uh, I believe their policies will change America for the worse, and that's the debate for me. That talking point, an apparent attempt to paint the progressive foursome known as the squad as the face of the Democratic Party, a possible window into Trump's 2020 strategy. We'll never, ever be a socialist country. It just won't happen. A vote for any Democrat in 2020 is a vote for the rise of radical socialism 
and the destruction of the American dream. Frankly, the destruction of our country. And President Trump's campaign held a conference call this morning with surrogates on how to respond to the controversy over the chant and lay out new messaging to keep the focus on attacking the squad. And even the White House's deputy press secretary implied the president couldn't clearly hear the chants because it was loud in the arena. Just some examples, Jake, of how officials have been trying to contain the fallout. Yeah, I remember President Trump saying he couldn't hear my question about whether or not he should disavow David Duke. Pamela Brown, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, Karen Finney, um, President Trump says he disavows and disagrees with the chants, and he had this message for his supporters. Well, these are people that love our country. I want them to keep loving our country. And I think the Congresswomen, by the way, uh, should be more positive than they are. The Congresswomen have a lot of problems. With Thoughts? Well, last night was frightening to watch. Never thought I would see that. I mean, as bad as it was in 2016, we are clearly uh, past the line. But we know what the strategy is because we lived through it in 2016. You know, it was the rise of the alt-right. It was the mainstreaming of hate speech and bigotry. It was very clear that was the strategy then, and it is the strategy now. This othering of these four women. And, you know, at its basic level, to my mind, this represents a fundamental change in this country. These four women represent a changing America. They represent different perspectives in this country and the reality that we are a minority-majority country. We're here. It's happened. We also know that fear of that change drove a lot of the people who voted for Trump in 2016, and he is counting on that and that race-baiting and fear-mongering to turn out for him again. I suspect I hope that particularly those people in the middle who last time mm -hmm. thought, well, let's see, how, how bad could it be? I hope they were as horrified last night uh, as I know my fellow Democrats were. Scott Jennings, as a Trump supporter, let me ask you, are you not concerned that this approach, and I get the theory of the case that the president thinks that there are more votes there if he just gins up his base, there are even more base votes there. Are you not concerned um, that this actually will hurt President Trump, I mean, forgetting the immorality of it for one second, that this will hurt President Trump's chances in the suburbs of Philadelphia, in Northern Virginia, in Colorado, North Carolina, et cetera. Well, I'm concerned that when you go down this path, you're showing a lack of confidence in the actual policy debate that I actually have a lot of confidence in. I think we can win on issues. I'm glad these four have been elevated to some degree because what they say and then what the Republicans say, I think we can win that debate. So when you go down a different path, I think it shows a lack of confidence. I mean, my view is they're American citizens. We all live under the same Constitution, the same Bill of Rights, and the same First Amendment. They have as much right to speak and be in politics as any of us sitting up here. I don't want to send her back. I want to send her to the nearest green room so she can put out her ideas and we can put out ours. I agreed with Lindsey Graham. That's where this has to be. When we go down a different road and show a lack of confidence in our ideas, that's what worries me. And people in the suburbs, who are they? College-educated, high-income white folks in the suburbs. They mm -hmm. stuck with Trump. They could get nervous about this. That's why we got to keep focused on issues. So you brought up Lindsey Graham. Uh, you agree with Lindsey Graham. And I assume you meant the Lindsey Graham that we saw in that clip just there where he said it needs to be a policy debate. I prefer to have that. Um, but this brings me to Tim Alberta, who's our guest, who has this uh, brand new book, uh, critically acclaimed. It's great. American carnage on the front lines of the Republican civil war and the rise of President Trump. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. When I was reading your book and then when I was preparing for the show, I was thinking that <laughs> Lindsey Graham, uh, is a character at the beginning of the book and a completely different character at the end of the book. And in fact, uh, take a listen to the, these two clips of Lindsey Graham, uh, one from uh, today and one from 2015. No, I don't think it's racist to say. I don't think a Somali refugee embracing Trump would not have been asked to go back. He's a race-baiting, xenophobic, religious bigot. He doesn't represent my party. It's almost like Lindsey Graham has been put through the machine of your book. Uh, this is the Republican Party before and after. Are you surprised uh, by what's happened to him and some other Republicans? No, I don't think you can be surprised, Jake. I mean, look, we could run down a long list of individuals who there's a before and after shot. Uh, Lindsey Graham is just another one. And we can't be surprised at what the president is doing, but I think at the same time we can't be surprised by the response or in many cases lack thereof a response from many of these Republican elected officials. To the point that President Trump made earlier, we all remember at the convention in Cleveland in 2016 during the chance of lock her up, do you remember what he did? He put his finger to his lips and he stopped them and he said, let's beat her instead. And it was a moment of restraint that was really striking, I think, to a lot of us because we said, wow, that's a new side of the president. We hadn't seen that before. Mm -hmm. 
he could have stopped that if he wanted to last night. He chose not to. And Lindsey's, Lindsey Graham's response today speaks to, I think, what is the fundamental question about today's Republican Party under Donald Trump. We had a period where in politics and within the parties and between the parties, there was a philosophical intellectual debate of ideas, as Scott was saying. Today's fault line that runs through the GOP it's a binary choice. Are you with Donald Trump or are you against Donald Trump? It's no longer about the size of government. It's no longer Tea Party versus establishment, yeah. country club versus insurgency. It's none of that. It's do you stand with the president unequivocally or are you willing to come out publicly and distance yourself from him? And the people that have, they're taking their careers into their own hands. It's a huge gamble and most of them aren't willing to take it. 